Our speaker for today is um, Sister Danita Wilkins. Please be blessed. Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. Good, good afternoon, everyone. And welcome once again to our presentation, to everyone here, to everyone on the screen up there. Uh, it's a bit distant, so I cannot see you, but we're glad to have you. I hope everyone's had a blessed Sabbath so far. Amen. 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 We have a lot to be grateful for, and um, I haven't heard that song in a very long time that Brother Tim just sang, but I remembered it when he started to sing it. It's been a very long time since I've heard that song. So thank you, Brother Tim. Yes. All right, so we're going to go ahead and press ahead with our study. Um, my prayer thought comes from Testimonies to Ministers, page 259 in paragraph one. It says, Jesus passed by the wise men of his time, the men of education and position, because they were so proud and self-sufficient in their boasted superiority that they could not sympathize with suffering humanity and become co-laborers with the man of Nazareth. In their bigotry, they scorned to be taught by Christ. And the Lord Jesus would have men connected with his work who appreciate that work as sacred. So whatever our role is in God's work today, we are to appreciate it as sacred. We are not to uh, uh, think that if we're not in a certain position that we don't have as much clout or whatever as we think somebody else has. But God is telling us that all of his work is sacred. And in his sight, whatever your role is, be grateful for it and do your absolute very, very best because he put us in our roles because he knows what he can make of us if we do them well. So it says, they will be unobstructed channels through which his grace can flow. An unobstructed channel. You see, God reaches man through man. We're told in the spirit of prophecy that he could have sent angels to do the work. You know, He could have figured some other way to get the work done, but he said, no, man has to work for man. And so whatever he does for us generally will come through people and will come through someone that he is using to help and bless us. And we have to have our eyes open to know that that's what this person is, is, is doing and is trying to do. And not um, think that, uh, that sometimes we think that God should speak to us uh, only and, and not use other people. But he does. And that's what this is telling us here. If we will see our work as sacred and appreciate it, the Lord says, then we will be unobstructed channels through which he can pass his grace. It says the attributes of the character of Christ can be imparted to those only who distrust themselves, distrust ourselves. We can't think that we know anything. Even if we know something, we can't think that we know anything because whatever we do know came from God. He gave it to us. We don't know it just because we're so smart and so intelligent. We know it, we're told, because his Holy Spirit has caused us to understand what he's talking about. Because without the Holy Spirit, we would no more understand what we're learning than do the people who don't have the, the, the Holy Spirit teaching them, you see? So we have to believe that we are distrustful of ourselves. And any one of us knows, if you give self half a chance, what happens? I'm sorry, you're going off onto some off-ramp. 
and you are no longer on the path because self is very determined, like I've said before, to kill all of us. That's the goal. So it says the highest scientific education cannot in itself develop a Christ-like character. Nothing can develop a Christ-like character except Christ and his grace. That's the only way we will ever get this Christ-like character. And it says the fruits of true wisdom come from Christ alone, not from having gone to university and not from having plaques up on our walls, not proving that we have you know, gone through a certain um, uh, stage of, of, of learning, you see? Because God has used people who have had zero learning to do mighty work for him. And if we would be found faithful to God, if we do have some intelligence, if he has given us the ability to learn in this world, don't take it to yourself as something that you did. It was still God. It was still God. So let us kneel with a, uh, for prayer with that thought in mind. Dear Father in heaven, we do thank you and give you praise and thanksgiving for this beautiful Sabbath day, for giving us this day every week that we can come aside, put, a, put down our secular thoughts, worries, concerns, work, and just spend the, the day uh, in your presence and with you and being blessed by you and your holy angels who are always with us. We thank you, Lord, for this prayer thought because it helps us to realize that in and of ourselves, we don't have the ability to do these things. And that only as we believe that and accept that and then walk like that, will you be able to use us in any kind of a meaningful way. We pray, Lord, that we will be willing to distrust ourselves um, every moment of the day. We know that self is not our friend and is not seeking our good, but rather is working with the enemy to bring us all down to destruction. So please help us, Lord, to see our great need of you, of your indwelling Holy Spirit, that we may be able to be true overcomers and sit with you as you sat with your Father. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. Okay, so our topic for today is perception. How perceivest thou? Now, what is perception? Feel free to raise your hand if you have any idea what perception is, and we will have a microphone brought to you. All right, I've got two hands. I saw Colette first. I saw Phil, Phil Sr. second. So what is perception? Understanding. Okay, understanding. And Brother Phil Scott over here. It's your idea of what you think is right. Your idea of what you think is right? Yes. Okay, all right. And Brother uh, um, blah, blah, blah. Jacob, yes. <laughs> it's okay. It's, um, it's the way that we see things based on our past experience. Okay, that's, very, that's right where I'm coming from. He said it's the way you see things based on your life experience. All of us have been raised in different families in different parts of the world and different cultures. All of us are different. All of us have um, um, ways of thinking that are our own personal, Nobody else thinks like we do because nobody else is us, right? So our perception, the way we view things, the way we view the world, the way we view people, um, all has to do with our own experience in life. That's the reality. So all of us in here and out there, every one of us has a different perception of life a different perception of, of everything that we deal with. And God realizes that there is a multiplicity of perception out here amongst us. And 
with Brother Houchef having written about Christianity that there's all of this multitude of schisms, et cetera, et cetera, and all of them can't be right, well, the same goes for our perception. All of us can't be right. And God has a way of perceiving things that he would like to teach us to use and use his perception, his way of looking at things to replace our way. And then that way we can connect more solidly with him. So perception is a very important thing because perception, uh, it, it, it deals with how you see people. It deals with how, how you come to conclusions about people. It deals with how you relate to people because in your mind you have all these thoughts, you have this perception. And so if the Lord is able to fix that in us, then we will be able to be closer and to be a family and to love one another even as he's asking us to do. And we won't have to be struggling and fighting and all of this, you know, back and forth and up and down if we would be willing to trade our perception for his. So from Christian Education, page 199, paragraph 2, it says, After association with the Son of God, the humble follower of Christ is found to be a person of sound principle, clear perception, and reliable judgment. He has a connection with God the source of light and understanding. Now this is after association with Christ. The Lord says, then we will have clear perception after our association. So the question is, how much associating are we doing with Christ? How much time are we spending with Christ, you see? Because we only get this clear perception. Now our perceptions, I, I, believe me, I know mine is all screwed, but our perceptions are not what they should be. Because again, it's based on our life experience, but we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. So what does that mean? Our life experience has been not in accordance with God's way, but in the way that we grew up and in the way that we lived before we met Christ. You see, so all of it has to be changed. But after our association with God, we will have this connection that will help us to get our perception on track. So now, I think most of us are familiar with the, the, the phrase, you can't see the forest for the trees. Too many trees, and you're in the forest. You don't know you're in the forest because all you see is trees. But if you're outside of it, maybe with a Google Maps thing or a Google Earth or whatever it's looking at, you can see the forest, you see. But when you're in it, we can't see it. And this is very important to know and understand because our forefathers, ancient Israel, who were in the wilderness, in the situation with Moses, in those experiences, they couldn't see anything either because they were in it. We can see it now because we're looking back, you see. We can see what, where they went wrong. We can see what they couldn't see because they were in it. And the same thing is with the Jewish nation when Christ came. They were in it. They, they couldn't see. They couldn't tell who he was. Now here we are with hindsight. We look back. We see. Because we're not in it. So the question becomes to us, are we in the, are we in the forest right now and can't see it? For us individually. Are, are we... Um, in this, in this preparation period, this wedding garment period, where we're supposed to be putting this wedding garment on, but because we're in it, we can't see that we're supposed to be putting it on. So we know we're supposed to be putting it on, but are we actually doing it? And I was talking to, I think, Jan, or I think it was Jan, but I was telling him, I said, you know, if we were to live 50 years from now, and we could look back at, our, at us as history, like we can look back at ancient Israel, we would see <laughs> because we would be outside of it and we would be looking back. But the fact that we're in it, we can't really tell how important it is that we get this garment on, you see? Because I've said before, I was telling my husband, I've used it in, in a presentation before, 
trying to get this wedding garment on is like a, 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 a parent trying to dress a two-year-old. You know how that goes? You have a two-year-old? You try to dress a two-year-old? What are they doing? Fighting, fighting. You, you get, you, you get, you're putting something over their head. They don't want it over their head. They're fighting to get it off. They pull it off. You get an arm in. They pull that arm out. You get the other arm in. They pull that arm out. They don't want to keep their shoes on. I'm sorry. It's fight. It's just battle, battle, battle. And that's how I see God with us, trying to get this wedding garment on. It's like we get a sleeve on. We get an arm in one way, and we think we're doing good. Next thing you know, we pull that out and... So that's why I'm asking, are we in the forest and we can't see the trees? Because this is our time to be getting dressed. From testimonies to ministers, every worker should test his own qualifications by the word of God. Have the men who are handling sacred things a clear understanding, a right perception of things of eternal interest See, that's the question. Do, do we have a, a right understanding? Can we see the weight of the work that we've been given to do? Or do we get up every day and we do our work, we go to, go to the office, go to the print shop, go to the wherever, and we do it, but it's not really sinking in that we're working for God. It's not really sinking in that the church itself is waiting for us to become these people so that, we can, so that they can see Christ in us and then they be impressed with us looking at Christ and the ball rolls. But if we don't have this right perception, if we're not able to see the sacredness and the uh, importance of this work that we've been given, then we will, it's no different than having a job out there. You get up, you go to work, you do your work, you come home, it's okay, and then you do the rest of your time, you see? But we have to realize that we're in the forest. This is our time. We don't get another time. We don't get another chance. It says, will they consent to yield to the work, excuse me, the working of the Holy Spirit? Or do they permit themselves to be controlled by their own hereditary and cultivated tendencies? See, do we still follow our own perception? Do we still see things through the same eyes we've been looking through our whole life? and we still can't tell the, the forest from the trees. See? It becomes all to examine themselves, whether they be in the faith. Are we in this to actually win it, or are we in this having the picture of the glory set before us, but not really doing what it's going to take to get them, to claim them, to have them be our own? God's amazing grace. All trials that are received as educators will produce joy. Now, what's your perception on trials? Is it God's perception? Is it this perception? Do we see them as educators? Are we happy when we're in the midst of these trials? See. That's a change of perspective. That's a change of, of, of perception. And if we would be able to overcome, we have to switch out our perceptions of things for the way God tells us we should be perceiving things, you see. All trials, all trials. And I'm just going to do this, and you don't have to. Raise your hand if every time you're in a trial, you're happy and joyous. Yeah? No. We still need some work to be done on us. And the Lord is asking us, please pay attention and please take heed to these counsels. I can't even raise my hand, so it's okay. Counsels on health. He, God, works through those who discern mercy in misery. Is that your perception of misery? Gain in the loss of all things. Is that our perception when we lose things? When we have to separate from things? When the light of the world passes by, privileges appear in all hardships. Is that our perception? 
we're privileged. Order in confusion. The success and wisdom of God in that which has seemed to be a failure. <laughs> you see, this is not how we think. And this is not how we react when we find ourselves in any of these situations. Hardships counted a privilege. Everything's confused. I'm confused. You're confused. But we see order in it. That's almost like an oxymoron or something. How, if you're confused, how do you see order? But the Lord says, if we have his perception, we do see order. And we will see order. And even that which looks like a failure. Do we see success and the wisdom of God in it? <laughs> Most of us have a lot to say about things when they go wrong and it looks like a failure. And it's not, praise God, because he's so wise. I'm sorry. It's anything but. You see, but the Lord is telling us if we would have our perception straightened out, this is how we have to see things. And this is the, 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 the um, path that we have to take in order to get out of the path that we're in. See, I, I truthfully, I'm surprised, you know, the more I realize how much of me has to be changed. You think, you, you think you, you're making progress? And I'm sure we all are. I, I know I am. But then there's more and more and more. And it's just like, oh, my. It just keeps coming. But this is where God is trying to lead us up Jacob's ladder, that we can put aside the way we see things so that he can actually bless us in all of this madness here, all of this. And if you're in misery, you know, that you see mercy in it, all of these things would make us much better Christians and make us much better Davidians. And we would be uh, um, uh, known and read of all men. It would be, it would be, there would be something wrong with us, people would think, because of the way we would be acting, the way we would be reacting to the things that are going on in the world. They would think something is wrong with us. And as far as they're concerned, it would be something wrong with us. But the more people we can convince to look at life this way, the better off their lives will be too. From councils on health, oh, here we go, more, yes. Treat of calamities as disguised blessings. Yes. Treat of calamities as disguised blessings, as woes, as mercies. <laughs> I tell you, the Lord, I believe the Lord has a sense of humor. I'm sorry. Uh, because he knows this is so foreign to us. This is so foreign to us. Work in a way that will cause hope to spring up in the place of despair. Now think about this. When somebody comes and they're telling you their woes, they're, 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 they're sharing their woes. Okay, fine. And we sit right there beside them and say, yeah, I know just how you feel. We are sympathizing. We are empathizing. We are just like, oh, my. I will pray for you. Mm. Mm. And the Lord is like, where's the hope in that? Where's the glory to God in that, see? And we think we're doing good because we don't, I, you know, it's not like we want to uh, uh, do a, a tap dance around them, uh, showing how, them how happy they should be. But the Lord is like, let me share this next statement. Here's the answer, Christ triumphant. Only look and live. We dishonor God when we do not go forth from the dark cellar of doubts in the, into the upper chamber of hope and faith. So someone is talking to you about a very bad situation. It doesn't mean that you clap your hands and say, woo, you know, uh, uh, you, you, you shout for joy and this and that. What it's saying is, is, is that you share hope. You share, you share faith. You cause them to look upward instead of looking straight at whatever it is that's going on. You see, it says, when the light shineth in all its brightness, let us take hold on Jesus Christ by the mighty hand of faith. 
No longer cultivate your doubts. Now, cultivate, we know to cultivate is to help something to grow. When we cultivate in the garden, when we, we want the things to grow. Do we want to cultivate doubts? No, we don't want to cultivate doubts. So the Lord says, no longer cultivate your doubts by expressing them and pouring them into other minds and thus becoming an agent of Satan to sow the seeds of doubt. You see? Rather, it said, talk faith, live faith, cultivate love to God. So this person is sharing their experience at the time, which is obviously not happy to them, but talk faith, live faith, cultivate love to God, evidence to the world all that Jesus is to you. We can't keep Jesus off in a closet somewhere and only whip him out when things are happy and good and this. We have to have Christ with us all the time. Christ has to be standing beside us, sitting beside us, and, and a, preferably on our right side, on our right hand. Okay? Yeah. So he has to be there to give us the words that we need to be able to encourage this one who is in the doldrums. But we can't go into the doldrums with them and tell them we know how they feel, and boy, oh boy, that's really bad, and mm, I don't know what you can do about this, and... That is not hope, that is not faith. So she says, magnify his holy name, tell of his goodness, talk of his mercy, and tell of his power. That's how we can help people. Very different from what we're used to doing. We're used to commiserating with people. And we don't want to do that. We want to point people's eyes heavenward every time the enemy is trying to force them to look earthward. We want to be the ones that God uses to get them up out of the cellar, she says, and into the higher upper rooms where faith and hope and light all are. See, now that's a whole different way of looking at things. That's changing another perspective or perception that we have. Familiar with that? Yes, half full or half empty. Now let's look at it this way. What do you think God would say if he looked at that glass? Half full? full? Uh Uh-huh. What do most of us say when we look at that glass? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Yeah. And some people do have the positive, but uh, it's all about positivity and negativity. Is God negative ever? I mean, seriously, is he ever negative? There's not one time we've read in the Bible where God was negative. And even when he was having the folk wipe out whole nations and all of this, he was still positive. And how did he say he was positive? He said because he was actually putting these people out of their misery. See, they didn't know if they were being helped. But he knew he was helping these folk out because he knew if they kept living, they would just have more and more sin to pay for. See. So he did him a favor. He was very positive when he was doing that. There was a, another time when, and I cannot remember when or where, there was another time when they had a glass, and you all may remember, it could have been something that you've seen, where they had a glass, and it was full of, uh, of uh, dirt. And so you look at the glass, and they say, is, you know, is the glass empty or full? And you would say full, because the dirt is up to the top. But then you know what they did? They poured water in it. And the water seeped all through it, seeped all through it, seeped all through it. It wasn't full, see. And then they did something else in there, and it went in. So you think it's, you think you're looking at, but there are other ways to look at everything. There's always other ways to look at everything. So we don't want to be pegged into a a, a hole where we're always looking at everything the same way, same way. And consequently, we are fixed in this mindset and we can't get out. You see, God would have us to know that there are many, many ways to look at things. And the best ways to look at them are through his eyes. From God's amazing grace. If we thought and talked more of Jesus and less of ourselves, we should have more of his presence. If we abide in him, 
we shall be so filled with peace, faith, and courage, and shall have so victorious an experience to relate when we come to meeting, that others will be refreshed by our clear, strong testimony for God. So what should we be sharing with one another? We should be sharing positive things. If we're being beaten by the enemy, and most of us, all of us actually are beaten by the enemy, left, right, and center, but that's not what we bring to, to share. That's not what we, we testify about, see? What we should be testifying about, and especially if you know you're being beaten up, talk faith. Talk faith. You know what that will do? Yes, and it will cause the enemy to leave you alone. It will cause the enemy to leave you alone. You see, Christ is our example. He's our example. And the enemy could never do anything to him. He tried and tried, but he couldn't get through, you see, because he was walled in by his father. He never stuck his head out. He never stuck his hand out. He never stuck his foot out. He stayed walled in all the time. And so whatever fiery darts the enemy threw at him, it's like the wall around him. The father just caught them and threw them back, see, because he did not allow himself to be unprotected ever, and this is what Christ is trying to teach us to do. Stay hid with Christ in God. And then he says the blow that is meant for you does what? Falls on him. Because we are enclosed in him. See? And we will have a very different way of looking at things as we take this on as our own persona that we actually are hid with Christ and God. Nothing the enemy can do can disturb us. And the only way these things do disturb us is because we let them in. We take it on. Somebody say something, we take it personally. Somebody look, they're not even looking at you. They're looking at something else. But you see them looking, you think they're looking at you. You take it on, you see. All of a sudden, everybody's got something to say about you. And I've said it before, nobody's thinking about you. Nobody's thinking about you, one way or the other, because everybody's too busy, what, thinking about themselves. You see? So we don't have to worry about somebody uh, 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 thinking about us badly, poorly, this, that, the other. They're not thinking about you. They're thinking about themselves. And then they, too, are wondering about the people who they think are looking at them. Yeah, it's okay. Nobody's looking at anybody. Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the renewing of our mind being transformed, it has all to do with change in how we see things. And that's just one area. It, obviously, we know it involves much more than that. But this area today, talking about perception, our minds have to be renewed so that our perception is changed so that we are not instantly, um, uh, what's the word, offended, that's the word. So that we're not instantly offended. We're not automatically thinking the negative about someone. And even if we have good reason to think negative, because everybody's not a saint yet, so yes, there are still people who go around lighting fires. So, even if we do have reason to think negative, we have to choose not to. We have to choose not to think that way. Because when we do, the enemy has got us again, you see. And now you have to repent your way out of that. And most of us have so much to repent for already, not kidding, we don't need to add more repentance, see. We need to deal with the repentance that we need to be repentant of that we already have before we add more onto it, see? And God is merciful. He doesn't pile us all on at one time with everything that is wrong with us because we would drown under it. It would be too much. A call to stand apart. God bids us fill the mind with great thoughts, pure thoughts. He desires us to meditate upon his love and mercy to study his wonderful work in the great plan of redemption. 
Now, if you are filling your mind with great thoughts and pure thoughts, and you're meditating upon God's love and mercy, and you're studying his wonderful work in the great plan of redemption, you don't have time to be thinking negative. It wouldn't even fit into your, into your, into your day, into your thoughts to think negative. Because you've got these great thoughts and pure thoughts and high thoughts and you're thinking about God's goodness. So there would be no, no way, no entrance for anything negative uh, from the enemy to make its way into your mind and then into your heart. Then clearer and still clearer will be our perception of truth. Higher, holier, our desire for purity of heart and clearness of thought. The soul dwelling in the pure atmosphere of holy thought will be transformed. Is that not a promise? Is that a promise? It's a promise. It's okay. It's a promise. By communion with God through the study of the scriptures. So, if we place ourselves in this mindset that allows no negativity, not one discordant thought, the Lord says, we will be transformed. That's a promise. And only as we do these things will we be transformed. There is no other way. There's no other way to be transformed except through connecting and staying com in communication with God. That's the only way. Because all day, every day, all of us know the enemy is waiting behind every bush, hiding in every person, waiting to throw them in front of you so that you can crash. So not only do you crash, but you fall over them because they're being used by the enemy and they don't know it. And so now you've got two people, you see. So we have to be on the alert. When somebody comes charging at us with some kind of madness in their eyes, <laughs> say, no thank you. And do not be pulled in. Do not take it on. Excuse yourself or try to calm them or try to find out what the situation is. But don't react. Don't just react because they're looking crazy. You're going to look crazy too. And in that way, the two of you can have at it. And the Lord is not glorified. The enemy is, is just tickled pink. And then you have to repent. And God has to show you again how you messed up. And I don't know about you all, but I, I, you, know, you get tired of messing up. You just get tired of messing up. And so only as we hold on to the Lord by faith. And that's by faith. That's by faith. You see, I believe Christ is standing here with me. I believe that all these empty seats are filled with holy angels. Amen. You see, but I can't see them. But I believe it. He said he's in there in every meeting that we have. I believe it, you see. But that takes faith. Because, like I said, they look empty to the naked eye. Again, a call to stand apart. Through conflict, the spiritual life is strengthened. Now, we, again, we know these things as theory. Through conflict, the spiritual life is strengthened. Trials well born will develop steadfastness of character and precious spiritual graces. The perfect fruit of faith, meekness, and love often mature best amid storm, clouds, and darkness. Now, if you want these graces, this is spiritual graces, faith, meekness, love, this is where you have to be, in the storm, clouds, and darkness. Because if you're standing in the bright light of the sun, there's no trial in that. You know, standing where all is glorious and all is peace and all is calm, there's no trial in that. See? It's when we're put in places that we don't know what to do with. It's when we're surprised by something that we didn't see coming. And now not only has it come, but it's like blown up and it's huge. And you really don't know what to do with it. See? That's where your faith is strengthened. And that's where your meekness should come in because you realize you can't do anything about whatever it is. It's beyond your control. So you have to trust God. You have to go to God. These things the Lord says matures best in storm clouds and darkness. So now, do we believe that? 
Astro when storm clouds meet you, no sooner you go out that door. It's so funny, I said that one time before. And no sooner than we went out the door, a storm cloud was waiting. And it hit. <laughs> and I, I said to the person, I said, do you not know that's what I just said as soon as you come out this door? <laughs> it's waiting for you right outside the door. And yes, it was. And it's like, wow, okay. <laughs> but that's how it is. The enemy sneaks up on us with these fiery darts and he throws them at us, you know. It could be a blanket of them, what they call a, 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 yeah, a mass thing where you just dump, you know, and you have to face it. But then you have to face it like Christ said, face it. You can't go like you normally <laughs> would react. You have to be like, hmm. You have to like pay attention. You have to like think instead of reacting. So I'm saying, do not be surprised if when you leave out of here today, something's waiting for you outside the door because it very well could be. Caution. Trees are obscuring the view of the forest for the next five miles. Okay? So we can't let the trees obscure <laughs> the view of the forest because we're in the forest. And we have to realize that we are in the forest and that we have to do these things that we have to do. And we don't get a pass, as Brother Trevor is very famous for saying. We do not get a pass. So from 11 Code 6. Fellow Christian, Satan knows your weakness. He knows your weakness. He knows all of our weakness. Therefore, cling to Jesus. Now, if Satan knows your weakness, now this is a, this is a thought too. Because if Satan knows our weaknesses, that means we have weaknesses. And if we have weaknesses, those are places where he can attack and attack and attack. And not until those weaknesses become our strengths will, be, will we be free of it, of the attacks. Because so long as they stay as weaknesses, they are areas for him to attack. And there are areas where we are vulnerable. And we will be hurt, as it were, by the attack because we were not prepared for it, because it's a weakness that we have. And that weakness can cost us our eternal life. We have to get rid of every weakness, all of them. Abiding in God's love, you may stand every test. Bring faith into your experience. Faith lightens every burden. Faith lightens every burden, relieves every weariness. Faith. So when you've been pressing on and pushing back and standing strong, and you know how Paul said, after having done all, just stand. Okay, well, you've done all, and you are just standing, and now your knees are getting tired and weak. But you're still standing, you see, and now you're getting thirsty. But you still stand it. The Lord say, stand. Because if you stand and your faith is called into action, it will strengthen. And just as it says, it will lighten every burden and relieve every weariness. Faith has the power to do that. And that's why God says we have to have faith, big faith. He says you can start out with faith as small as a mustard seed. But you don't want to leave it like that. Because the vision that Sister White had, she said, remember the big green cords? She said they were like, they, it grew into the size of the body of a person. And that's not a teensy little faith anymore. That's a huge faith. Providences that are now mysterious, you may solve by continued trust in God. Walk by faith in the path he marks out. Trials will come, but go forward. This will strengthen your faith and fit you for service. Go forward, always go forward, never step back, never step to the side, never turn around, don't even sit down, just keep going forward because God is able to give you the strength to keep going forward. Because he can't say go forward and he knows you made of dust, you see. The enemy knows we're made of dust. So when God says go forward, that means he has to give us the power and the grace to go forward. And it's not of ourselves that we can do this. 
The records of sacred history are written not merely that we may read and wonder, but that the same faith which wrought in God's servants of old may work in us. Amen. That's why it's written. We don't ooh and ah over Moses or over Abraham or over any of these. Ooh, wow, they had such great faith. God is saying, look at their life and take hold of their faith, the same faith. It's available to every one of us because we have to walk through the same fiery furnace as they did. And they were able to get through because of their faith. And God says that same faith is available for us today. In no less marked manner will the Lord work now, wherever there are hearts of faith to be channels of his power. So faith is the key to everything. Without it, we can't do anything. From selected messages, we have an advocate pleading in our behalf. The Holy Ghost is continually engaged in beholding our course of action. We need now keen perception. We have to have this keen perception. We have to be seeing things the way God would have us to see them or the enemy will overthrow us that by our own practical godliness, the truth may be made to appear truth as it is in Jesus. The angelic agencies are messengers from heaven, actually ascending and descending, keeping earth in constant connection with the heaven above. These angel messengers are observing all our course of action. They are ready to help all in their weakness guarding all from moral and physical danger according to the providence of God, you see. So they are with us. This is their job. This is the work that they do. And every night I thank God for them because their faithfulness is the same as God's faithfulness. You would think they would get tired of running back and forth between heaven and earth, and especially dealing with people who are not halfway cooperating with them in the first place. But they're faithful. And they go back and forth and back and forth and up and down all day, every day. For centuries they've been doing it. And they don't get tired. They don't say to the Lord, well, you know, we've been doing this for a while now. I don't think they're too interested. Can we stop now? See, they don't say that. They do his will. And it says, according to his providence, that's the help we get. Because he tells them what to do for each one of us. They don't just do on their own. They get their orders from, from Christ. So it says, And whenever souls yield to the softening, subduing influence of the Spirit of God, under these angel ministrations, there is joy in heaven. The Lord himself rejoices with singing. <sighs> That's such a nice thought. When you're obedient, when I'm obedient, Christ rejoices singing. with singing. If we can get there, we'll get to hear him sing. <laughs> That's going to be very interesting. From Gospel Workers. The characters of many who profess godliness are imperfect and one-sided. These show that as pupils in the school of Christ, they have learned their lessons very imperfectly. Now, we do not want to stay in this class. I expect that all of us are in this class of having learned our lessons very imperfectly because we're not fully rounded. We're not fully orbed. We do well in some areas, not so well in other areas. You know, the principles are the same for everything. All the principles are just the same every, in everything. But we have areas where we're not quite yet ready, willing to let go. We're not yet quite ready to actually change just yet. A little bit maybe, but not all the way. So we have these one-sided imperfect characters that we're doing. See? But we don't want to stay in this class of student. It says, some who have learned to imitate Christ in meekness do not show his diligence in doing good. Others are active and zealous, but they are boastful. They have never learned humility. 
Still others have Christ, leave Christ out of their work. They may be pleasing in their manners. They may show sympathy for their fellow men, but their, but their hearts are not centered on the Savior and they have not learned the language of heaven. They do not pray as Christ prayed. They do not place his estimate upon souls. They have not learned to endure hardship in their efforts to save souls. Some, knowing little of the transforming power of grace, become egotistical, critical, harsh. Others are plastic and yielding, bending this way and that to please their fellow men. So all of these are ways that we have come upon for these one-sided and imperfect characters. And wherever we see ourselves in this, I pray to God no one of us is all of these, but wherever we see ourselves in here, take heed, and it's okay. Thank God for showing you, you see, because you may not have known that this was you, but if the Holy Spirit convicts you on any part of this, praise God, and then work with him, cooperate with him, ask him, plead with him to help you to overcome this, whatever it is so that you don't have to continue with this one-sided character which will not get us into the kingdom. That's not going to get us from point A to point B. Can you see that? You see the thing down on the floor? Mm -hmm. Everybody's seeing it through their own perception. This one sees it as an eight. This one sees it as an eight written out. This one sees it as infinity. <laughs> This one sees it as a wave. This one says it's a pretzel. And this one says it's a string of DNA. You see the different perceptives? One thing everybody's looking at, but everybody sees something different based on their own background, based on their own life experience, based on the training, whatever they've had. They've come to these different conclusions about just what this thing is laying on the floor. from gospel workers. However zealously the truth may be advocated, if the everyday life does not testify to its sanctifying power, the words spoken will avail nothing. If our everyday life is not in harmony with what we profess, what we share, with what we want people to believe, the Lord says it'll avail nothing. We won't have any fruit to show for all that sharing because our own lives are not in harmony with it. And if our own lives are not in harmony with it, then the Holy Spirit can't do anything. We tie his hands. We keep going out. We keep holding studies. We keep holding meetings, this, that, and the other. Five years later, nobody come in. Ten years later, nobody's come in. Think about it. Ask the Lord why. And he will tell us why. An inconsistent course hardens the heart and narrows the mind of the worker and then places stumbling blocks in the way of those for whom he is laboring. So this uneven character, uh, what she called it before was, yeah, imperfect and one-sided. The Lord says the longer we stay in that, the harder our own heart gets. Because the longer we stay in it, we can't see it. The less we can see. The less the Holy Spirit is, angel to, is able to convict us of it. And it could be that someone has said something or, or tried to help or tried to uh, uh, open some eyes or something and we refuse. We say, no, that's not me. I'm not like that. I don't know what, who you're thinking about, blah, blah. The Lord says we're hardening our own heart and narrowing our own mind. And then the Holy Spirit has a harder and harder time to convince us of what our problem is. And on top of that, the Lord says, These, this inconsistency puts a stumbling block in the, in the way of the people that you're trying to share the truth with. Because they see you, they see your life, they see whatever it is they see. And yet you're talking about all of this righteousness and goodness and 
a, a wedding garment and, you know, uh, being like Christ, but you yourself are not like that, not representing like that. So they have a hard time accepting what you're saying and stumble over it. From signs of the times, strife and contention cannot exist among those who are controlled by the Spirit of God. When we see strife and contention, we know that the people are not controlled by the Spirit of God. And that's in our very midst. That's in our everyday life. If we are causing strife or involved in strife, in contention, in um, um, problems, in difficulties, the Lord says we're not controlled by the Holy Spirit. Now we can say, yes, we are, yes, we are, because I'm a Davidian and I have my certificate. But the Lord is saying, no, you're not, no, you're not. See? Because as soon as we step out of grace, as soon as we step out of the, you know, the lines he has where we stay within those lines, and if we stay in here, we're in the good part. But if we break out, well, once we break out, we're out there. We're outside of where God can help and bless us. See? So it says a truly Christ-like character cannot be subverted. A truly Christ-like character cannot be subverted. It cannot be offended. It cannot be pulled into strife. It cannot be pulled into contention. It cannot be pulled into anything that is contrary to God. Cannot means it's not possible because it's truly converted, subverted. It says here, and I like this. This is my uh, final one to share, but I have some things at the end here. But it says envy, jealousy, malice, and persecution may be hurled against those who bear the divine impress. But then it says, but it only serves to strengthen that which it cannot overthrow. So you have this character. You have this divine Christ-like character. And whatever is done against you, the Lord says what? It's strengthening you. It's not pulling you down. It's not causing you to uh, uh, fire back or react in some negative way. All of this opposition, the Lord says, it only strengthens what it cannot overthrow. That's like absorbing energy from a, a negative situation. And the negative situation is supposed to bring you to your knees. But instead of bringing you to your knees, you stand there and you take it. What's happening to you? You're coming stronger. And that's why God says, look at these things like this, and you will become very strong. Nothing will be able to overthrow you, and that's not even the devil. So now, how to change your perception. Number one, make sure that your prayer, study, and meditation time is enough to carry you through to your next prayer, study, and meditation time so that your connection is not broken. See? Make sure you spend enough time in your prayer and study and meditation to carry you through to the next time you do it so you can stay connected to God. Yield to the working of the Holy Spirit. Receive trials as educators. Think and talk more of Jesus and less of self. See mercy in misery, gain in loss, privileges in hardship, order in confusion, and God's success and wisdom in failure. See these things. Make them part of how you view things from now on. Number six, see calamities as disguised blessings. When something comes sideways to you, count it a blessing and count your woes as mercies. And they are mercies because your woes are teaching you to be strong. They're teaching you to be resilient. They're teaching you to be persevering, see? That's how we get the blessing out of these things that up to now maybe we kept seeing as negatives to be resisted. Fill your mind with great, pure thoughts. Meditate on his love, mercy. Study his work in the plan of redemption. Always go forward. 
Never retreat. Never turn back. Never look away. Always go forward. Will strengthen your faith and fit you for service, he says. And an inconsistent course hardens our heart, your own heart, and it puts stumbling blocks in the way of others. And finally, envy, jealousy, malice, persecution only strengthen what it cannot overthrow. So may the Lord bless us. May we learn to have, uh, uh, have a desire to have our perception twisted. I'm sure it's it twisted in the wrong direction at this point, but the Lord is trying to twist it back in the right direction. So we want to cooperate and agree with him and allow him to do the work in us that has to be done. Otherwise, we can't get go through. Thank you all.